afternoon, everyone. My name is Mary Campbell and I'm ESA's Membership and Data Operations Manager and I'll be your technical host during today's online session. Thank you for joining the ESA webinar series. Today we're going to be exploring two great topics around starting social science collaborations. First, we will hear from Drs. Erica and Keith Mocktinger about interdisciplinary connections and course development, followed by a presentation by Drs. Hannah and Jared Penn highlighting how economics and surveys complement entomology. During today's session, we'd like to make sure you're getting the most out of participating in this online course. So all attendees' video and audio will be disabled on entry to the call and during the presentations. However, I'll update these settings, enabling video and audio during the interactive portions of this learning experience. We'll be utilizing breakout rooms as part of today's activities, and I'd encourage you to share your video and audio at that time to interact with your fellow participants. At this time, I'd also like to bring your attention to the chat tool. Chat with other participants will be disabled initially. However, you will have the ability to send messages to staff directly. There will be designated breaks for Q&A, so please direct your questions or concerns during the session to ESA, and we will filter those comments to the speakers. If you're having any technical problems, please type a note in the chat box for staff directly. At this time, I will turn over the session to Dr. Erica and Keith Mochtinger to begin their presentation. I have to unmute myself. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. So I'm going to share my screen uh, and make sure that that can go through. All right. Can we see the screen? Is it up for everyone? It is. Awesome. Great. All right. So good afternoon, everyone. So we're really excited to be chatting uh, again about interdisciplinary education. Uh, this is a follow up to what we conducted at ESA in the fall. Um, and the first part of this webinar, we'll be talking about making interdisciplinary courses. And to order, in order to really dive into that, we have to define what interdisciplinary courses are, uh, although it may seem pretty straightforward. But, so interdisciplinary education overall is an effort to apply knowledge or values or principles to more than one academic discipline simultaneously and kind of relate these together through a central theme. In our case, that's likely entomology, uh, but you can also use different issues or problems or topics or even an experience. And so there are many ways to approach interdisciplinary education. So, I want to give you a little bit of background of where we're coming from on this topic uh, in our experiences. So my experience with interdisciplinary education came from teaching uh, Principles of Entomology course at the Univers University of Florida. This was a two credit general science course for both majors and non-majors and it was taught in a conceptual style of interdisciplinary ed which we'll talk about in a few minutes and it was primarily laboratory or discussion based. Hi, I'm Keith Mackinger, and my cross-curricular course I taught and co-created is Plagues Through the Ages, which was a collaborative effort with an epidemiologist, and it was mainly for non-majors with a lecture and a discussion section, and it was much more collaborative than conceptual with Erica's, and we'll, again, we'll hit that later. So that leads us to what is the compelling question of this workshop? In other words, what are we trying to look at today? How do you develop an interdisciplinary course? I mean, that's really what we're gonna be looking at here. And how do we get there? We're gonna look at the benefits of using interdisciplinary instruction. We're gonna draw some connections across disciplines. We're gonna look at how to plan a course, identify some key resources and techniques that you can use. And then we'll discuss some challenges and opportunities that we might see once we, once we dive into interdisciplinary learning. Okay, so likely all of you have some reason for being here at this webinar, whether it's you know inherently that interdisciplinary education can be really helpful to students or you've experienced this during your own education and have seen the benefits. But what does the literature say on interdisciplinary ed? We know from studies that interdisciplinary education increases student motivation for learning and engagement. They can apply this integrated knowledge better and it helps to make the material more relevant and can improve learning by using skills to really explore the content. 
But in order to do this, you have to be able to make those connections. So connect what you know, say in entomology, with what, uh, what other piece of education you're trying to bring in. So we're gonna do a little activity here, uh, looking at ways to make connections across disciplines. So you can see on the left, we have several connection options or other content areas, they include things like economics and politics and travel and so on. And so the first one we're gonna look at is integrated pest management. So for those of us in, in entomology, we're probably aware to some degree of what IPM is, but we're gonna connect that now with international trade. All right, so many of you likely know that mosquitoes can transmit many pathogens like yellow fever and malaria and develop in wet areas that include ditches, canals, swamps, and, and so on, and do really well in warm places, places like Panama. So how does that connect to inter or to, uh, to travel? Well, and this is, this is where I, I come in, and the, the outbreaks of yellow fever and malaria in the Panama Canal Zone, it's, it's a great cross-curricular connection. Um, the use of IPM measures in the building of the canal was what really allowed the U.S. to succeed where the French had failed in trying to build this canal. The result for world trade was, was massive. And having the U.S. controlling the canal zone, as opposed to someone like France, um, was a key component to U.S. dominance in the whole region. So we can see that this is, it's bigger, the connection here is way bigger than just the IPM piece. All right, let's look at a different example. Maybe history is not really what you're interested in. Maybe it's more uh, in art or music. So let's take a look at beetle taxonomy. All right, so not everyone is really interested in taxonomy. I know some are, and that's fantastic. But how do you engage students that may not be non-majors into being interested in taxonomy? And how do you make it more relevant? We can connect it with something like art or entertainment or culture, uh, music. And so for those of you who are at ESA in Vancouver, you may remember the closing plenary session where an artist was recounting his inspiration for many of his sci-fi concepts coming from nature, in particular beetles. And you can see here in the bottom left, this black weevil was used as the inspiration for this primitive walker in one of the Star, Star Wars prequels. So we really use beetle taxonomy or shape and function to drive art. And that's seen in the top left when we when we look at Egyptian art with scarab beetles and how um, how it becomes a real large piece of that. Or in the top right, where the boll weevil and its its effect on the southern economy and it, it became a part of southern culture. We see the lyrics to um, one of many boll weevil inspired songs. So what we're going to do is we're going to have you guys have a shot at this. It's your turn to make some of these connections. So we will be placing you guys in breakout rooms. And that's the time where you'll feel free to turn your cameras on if you want to, if you want to have that face-to-face, -face, if you have the option. I'm not sure um, how the technicality is going to work. And as a group in your breakout, set, in your breakout rooms, you're going to choose one or two, if you look along the side on the left side, one or two entomological focus areas. And then what you're gonna do is try to make some connections to some of the options on the side, whether it be towards economics or travel and trade or culture or some another science or history and see where you can find those connections. Um, make sure that you choose one person that will share out your findings when we reconvene. They'll do that in writing via the chat feature. So we'll give you five minutes to have that discussion in your groups. And when you come back, we'll have that, we'll have that share out. All right, we're in breakout room one. <laughs> Everybody, or do they just do two breakout rooms? I'm not sure, but this is fine. <laughs> so those of you that are here, that are on this webinar, feel free to unmute yourselves if you can, uh, hopefully you can, and share your screens and we can, uh, we can chat about those topics that you would like, you'd like to pick.
I'll kind of let you guys dictate here. What do you, where you guys want to go with this? Oh, I can share my video too. <laughs> Did you see? <laughs> here I am. I don't see everyone's hiding in the corner. These are all back of the room sitters. <laughs> What about you, Hannah? We're gonna start um, calling out people. Okay. Well, I can. I was actually thinking about the the kissing bug, um, mostly because I currently live in southern Texas, where we actually have the kissing bug is a, a big problem in certain uh, neighborhoods based on whether or not they um, have window screens and and essentially good housing. Um, but also, if we bring it back to history and even science. Um, I, I guess I remember learning that kissing bugs were uh, potentially problematic for uh, Darwin, I think, during some of his travels, and that it may have impacted his ultimate health. Um, you know, so you could integrate that in terms of storytelling, both socio-politically here um, with demographics and, you know, why people are impacted or historically via Darwin. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um... I was thinking of one more um, culturally, like I, I deal a lot with ticks, but you know, does anybody have any thoughts on with this COVID situation, how ticks may become more or less relevant based on changes of behavior, so cultural changes? Does anybody have any thoughts on that? Can we can we make anyone speak? <laughs> Is anyone actually out there? Here we go. Somebody's unmuted. <laughs> This is Rosina. Mine's not related to ticks, but I was thinking from my perspective on ESA staff, how with the honeybees, how often hotels and cities will sell me on the hives that they have on the convention center or the hotel and always present their honey, locally made honey from that hotel to me as like this huge selling point to get our meeting. And so when I was looking at your list, I was like, oh yeah, that definitely comes at me all the time. Sure. Right. And there's an, econ there's an economic component of that as well. Absolutely. They always are very impressed with themselves as if it's very original. Definitely. Right. Yeah. <sighs> well, everyone loves bees, the people. All right. So I'm not sure how many other folks we're going to get to. Oh, there, there's Jared. Hi, Jared. <laughs> we're going to get to say much. So we can go ahead and um, break back out. I don't know how we get, if there's another group, if we get them back. But maybe Mary can do that. We do have a raised hand. Oh, cool. Oh, excellent. Let me. I think that's what Dr. Raza, feel free to share. I think we probably can hear you. <laughs> All right, Mary. Well, we can we can uh, follow that up. Let's keep going to make sure we um, can get to the end of this. So, do we just leave room, or how do we get back out of this breakout? Sure, I'll close it out. Awesome. Okay. Do this. Well, hopefully those of you who um, weren't able to maybe voice your uh, thoughts, maybe you're thinking about this a little bit more anyway, which is, which is super. So we're going to continue ahead uh, and talk about planning for interdisciplinary courses. Um, all right. So now you have a better idea of those connections. We need to plan for those courses, and there are some questions you need to ask yourself in order to be able to do that. This is not very different from what you would do for any course that you want to put together. So what do you want to teach? What you want your students to know? What resources that you need to get your students to that position of, of knowledge? And what then you need to know to do that? And we had mentioned this earlier, that there are um, some different types of 
uh, collaborations that you can do to create interdisciplinary courses. So um, I'm going to move this little blob thing of, of Zoom. So we have aligned collaboration. So these are aligning with multiple departments uh, or courses to kind of cross teach. So you may have cross listed courses. So maybe you're not integrating all the knowledge. Maybe you have the entomology piece, but you're working with somebody else in another course to kind of uh, mesh together with that. You have cooperative collaboration. So this is co teaching. So this is working on a single course with multiple faculty. But then you also have conceptual. So this is where you are responsible for the knowledge of that course. So this is, um, it may not be an entire course too, it could just be a single lesson. And then you need to clearly define your objectives and what you want that course to be. Again, this is, is very similar to how you'd set up a, a normal course, but the, the challenge here is making sure that you're selecting benchmarks or standards from both of the areas to be integrated to make sure you're trying to get that information uh, hammered home, identified cross-curricular activities that can do that to meet those benchmarks, and then performance assessments that actually incorporate those benchmarks as well. So making sure that you're looking on, on both sides um, to, to get that knowledge gain. So the big question comes here. Um, I'm no expert in these other fields and you're gonna only be an expert really in your own field. So the question is, how do I figure out what I don't know but need to know in order to teach this? Well, obviously reading is always the best place to start. Many of you guys have access to research tools that people outside of academia don't have. Also, you're often surrounded by experts. Reach out to them, talk to experts in these other fields. Don't, don't be afraid to reach out to members of other departments if you're on a university or in whatever setting you're in. They're, they're often very willing to help they're willing to get involved. And that's a really important piece is that reaching out and, and going to the people who know maybe those connections you don't know. Which leads us to how do we find resources and what techniques tend to work really well in a cross-curricular classroom? So this is where we're gonna try the share out again, but we're gonna do it just in the chat function. So what materials or resources have you used in the past or could you envision using in a cross-curricular setting? So let me see if I can pull up the chat feature, see what, feel free just to, anybody type in, what are some things that you've used in the past or could envision using when you're doing cross-curricular work in terms of resources or materials? Or even in your own courses. Yeah, even in your own courses, sure. Okay, bees for both science and business. No, business. That's, well, yeah, I guess you have bees set up as a business. <laughs> that makes sense. Have you used, for, for Jared, have you used uh, any specific resources like articles or um, uh, like how-to guides or something like that to bring that information into your classroom? Oh, no, it's just, it's more the idea that I've always wanted to bridge um, sort of the science of bees and the business of beekeeping mm. into a um, interdisciplinary course. Sure, sounds like a great idea for an interdisciplinary course. Think about in your courses. Maybe, Erica, you can flip the slide and we can start yep. seeing some examples. And you guys feel free to still keep throwing some of the uh, chat stuff in here. But if we're going to look at some things you can use. Articles. I'm sure you guys in your teaching have used articles. But I want you guys to think of articles as being broader than that. They can be scholarly articles, but they can also be news articles, opinion articles, um, it really runs a game, and especially if you're teaching non-majors. Some of those scholarly articles may go a little bit too much into the weeds, whereas some of the um, opinion or news articles may bring in some of those outside ideas. Um, obviously, collaborators are a great tool. Um, we showed you earlier with songs, um, books, or poems, poetry. I know a lot of people don't, don't often think poetry when you think of cross-curricular, but that's, that's a great direction to go. Um, if you don't want true collaborators, guest speakers make sense, hit videos, movies, 
You can bring in historical documents. Um, and then there's the activities that go really well here. Things like think pair shares, turn in talks, jigsaw activities, debates or simulations. All of those are things that you can use. And obviously later, if you, if you have questions about how to use any of these during the Q&A, we'll be glad to share how we, can, how we have in the past and how you could in the future use some of these things. All right, so in order to bring this kind of together, and talk about some of these resources and how we have found value in some of them. We're going to take you through um, a, a couple um, examples. So the first one is from, again, that University of Florida Principles of Entomology course. Again, this is non-majors, general science credit. This is a single lesson that I did. It was IPM, again. Um, IPM connects to so many things, and, and it's really easy to draw these connections. So. The primary focus of this lesson was connecting it to policy. And I used uh, video, I uh, used current events, and I ended up using a book as well to make these connections. And I'm gonna kind of show how that worked. So the first thing I did was play a video on um, how this, ooh, that was really loud, on how the history of, of insecticide application was kind of focused. I'm going to pause it because we're getting some feedback. Um, but there's a bit of a shock factor in this when you see this so, so spray. When you see this spray. Meeting me. Somebody's not muted. That's all right. Um, when you start getting students engaged, they didn't believe that DDT and other products were, were sprayed like this in common places. And so the topic of IPM not only related to IPM policy and the development of the EPA, but also current control of malaria, discussions on uh, Malthusian principles of population regulation and whether or not malaria should actually be controlled. Um, and, and kind of playing devil's advocate, I kind of provoked the, the students to ask those questions. And then we could dive into primary literature and, and, and really find that, yeah, if we work to eliminate malaria, a decrease in poverty would end, uh, lead to a decrease in birth rate, which would actually reduce the population. So we got into these really deep concepts just by talking about IPM. And let's look now at an example from my class that I used. The topic for our week was yellow fever transmission, and our curricular connection was to history. And we start with a lecture on yellow fever epidemiology by my collaborator. So that's where it's kind of outside of my expertise. She talks about all, all of the, the scientific aspect of this. Then we have the students read an article on the effect of yellow, the effect yellow fever had on the Haitian Revolution and ultimately on the Louisiana Purchase. You want to switch it, Eric? Down. There you go. Um, we then have a discussion section later in the week where students are encouraged to use their newfound knowledge to make those connections among the epidemiology of the disease, the life cycle of mosquitoes, the historical significance of the Haitian Revolution, modern day implications, all to kind of tie everything together in that face-to-face -face discussion section. Now, obviously there are challenges out there and We'll, we'll go back to that chat and what challenges, does anybody see any challenges, they foresee any challenges they might encounter? Let, let's jump back to that chat thing and feel free, just type, type in there if you see what, what could you, what could be a roadblock in terms of developing a course or just within a course, some cross-curricular activities. Absolutely. We, we've, in my course, I've definitely found that the different levels of background knowledge of the students um, really, really shows um, in terms of the background knowledge on the uh, entomological side and on the historical or economic side. And, and that can be a challenge. And that's where a real good um, discussion leader can really tie those together. Um, engagements of the students that may feel more comfortable with one side of the topic and not the other. Absolutely. Um, you're gonna find students that are gonna fall on often on one side. Um, and it's really important that we tie those two together and show how important they are connected, not just separate. Let's look at some other challenges that at least we thought of. Um, you having the background knowledge. Obviously we come in, maybe we don't have the background knowledge to make all those connections or we come in with certain biases. 
Um, anytime you're team teaching, you have to, you know, you have to coordinate teaching styles and trust. Um, time, it, it definitely is a roadblock. It takes time to make a good course, any course, especially a cross-curricular course. Um, we have to always take into account student learning styles and try to get them motivated. And then, of course, there is the approvals and the marketing and all that other stuff we know we have to go through. And then we also have benefits, so uh, or opportunities, let's call them, um, which can be perceived as benefit. So uh, you have broader reach. So in these cross-listed courses or collaborative courses, uh, you can reach students from a variety of different uh, interest groups and maybe even cross colleges. Uh, you have increased learning gains, improved discussions often once you can uh, get student buy-in that can really lead to some really interesting discussions and potentially even new educational paths. So courses, of course, but maybe even a certificate or minors, depending on um, how how many of these courses can be put together. And then of course, there's, there's the inherent benefit of, of you looking good. So this is great for tenure and reviews, uh, awards, or, or even just self-fulfillment that you took some interests that you had and maybe you had, um, you know, some hobby interest or were just interested in learning something else and you we're able to put that together. So there are some real opportunities to do uh, interdisciplinary ed as well. So, <laughs> so in the end, we kind of took you through the whole process quickly, but uh, for interdisciplinary education, understanding the benefits, drawing connections, understanding planning and foundations for interdisciplinary courses, it's really not that different from your your normal course structure, you just have to think on both sides uh, and identifying some potential resources and how those are used and then understanding the challenges and opportunities. Now we didn't talk about institutional differences uh, or challenges because that's going to differ based on where you are uh, and the requirements that your institution actually has, which brings in another level potentially of challenges, but um, there are some real opportunities as well. And we have uh, our information here in this last slide. So if anybody processes this, I know we went through this piece really fast. If you process it and you're interested in reaching out or finding what resources that we've used or are interested in, um, you know, getting a, a bigger list from us, we're always welcome or willing to help you. Great, great. Thanks so much, guys. Um, I think as we prepare for the next presentation, we have time for um, maybe one question. I did have one submitted to me. Um, the question is, how do we effectively connect social and hard scientists together so projects can be formed? We're very rare, we very rarely go to the same conferences and professional gatherings, and oftentimes universities do not facilitate cross-departmental de or cross-college networking events. So how do you, so how do hard scientists connect with social scientists with similar interests? So I'm going to answer that because, um, and Keith, you can you can have a second if you want to answer it too, but um, this is something I actually have thought about quite a bit and done, and it's, it's along the same lines as kind of the general public, well, how do I find a, a professional to ask about question X? Well, the answer is they're always willing or should be willing to answer your email. So you reach out to them and say, hey, I'm really interested in doing this. Are you interested in doing this? Or do you know anybody who may be? So that's the first way to do it. The second way to do it is um, actually social media is one of the best places I found to, to make some of these connections saying, hey, I want to do this. Does anybody know anybody else who's interested in doing this? Or is there anybody in X field that's interested in doing this? And I've actually made two collaborations just by posting it on Twitter. Um, and you can you can talk with those folks there and, and, you know, start developing projects that way. So I guess my biggest piece of advice is don't be shy. Um, the worst thing they can say is, no, I'm busy. And then you, you see if you can find somebody else. So if you have an idea and you want to run with it, then just reach out. And I'd like to piggyback on what Erica said. With my collaborator, it was very much um, a reach out to me and I was very much interested and we sat down, we discussed it and things kind of went from there, but we didn't, we didn't have a prior um, connection. I, she reached out to me and we, we made a connection. So sometimes it just, you gotta be a little bold to make those connections. I know the universities don't do a great job of making those connections for you. Okay, great. Um, 
Um, so now we're going to switch things up a little bit, and I'll turn the session over to um, Dr. Uh, Jared and Hannah Penn to begin their presentation. Okay, can can everyone hear me? Yep, you're good. Wonderful. Okay, so, and is the screen visible for for the audience? Yes. Okay. So give me just one more second to make sure that uh, I can pull up the chat bar. Good. I think I'm good to go. Uh, all right, so uh, thanks everyone for being here with us uh, this Thursday afternoon. Uh, as you can see, the talks are very different. The first is uh, oriented towards interdisciplinary teaching. And this is uh, one aspect of interdisciplinary, and that's the aspect of economics, um, economics and surveys. Uh, those are topics that um, traditionally haven't been mixed together. Economists traditionally uh, aren't folks who do surveys, but in the last few decades, they've really become much form more familiar with uh, the use of survey techniques to um, investigate economic values. And uh, so I'll be doing uh, most of the talking. Hannah and I have worked together on a few projects, um, and I'd love uh, for her to chime in as uh, questions are provided in terms of what it's like to work in an interdisciplinary team, on, on grant writing, all those types of things. Um, this is this has elements of both sort of broad philosophy as well as sort of um, detailed how to go about writing a survey. Um, you know, some of it is to basically provide you with opportunities to think of questions because um, you've got an economist here in the room, um, and some of it is just okay. If you have to go write a survey, how can you do it better? So uh, my training. I'm, I'm an environmental economist, and I've done quite a bit of environmental uh, uh, work in entomology. Um, so I've done work in bed bugs, native and honeybees, uh, butterflies, biocontrol is a new one that I'm working on, food waste is a new one I'm working on, IPM and BPMs. Um, and in each of these, I have done a survey. Um, as you can see in some of these pictures, uh, sometimes the survey looks like it's in person. This, uh, this survey up here on the top, this picture on the top left, this is us doing a, uh, a monarch and viceroy survey, trying to understand how people value uh, what may, or, you know, being currently under consideration for the endangered species list. Um, sometimes it looks like native pollinator conservation. This work down here in the bottom right is Hannah showcasing a survey opportunity to beekeepers in Louisiana. Sometimes it does look like a simple online survey where we query, you know, a thousand uh, U.S. Uh, households on their perception of, of bed bugs in hotel rooms. So it really just varies with the topic, um, but it's been a pleasure to work with all the, the variety of entomologists. So on to this first part uh, with respect to collaborating with an, uh, an, an economist or a social scientist. Um, this the first thing to dispel, and we'll start with the, the frame of reference that everyone can understand, which is the null hypothesis. So the null hypothesis, all natural or physical scientists are the same. And so I can show you three famous scientists, and you should immediately see that no, the null is, is in fact false. Uh, chemists are not the same thing as physicists are not the same thing as biologists. Okay? We know it's not true in broad science. We also know it's not true in particular fields. So we know that an entomology ecologist are not the same thing as urban entomologists are not the same thing as physiologists. All right. Well, this same logic holds true for the social scientist. Sometimes uh, folks will approach me and say, well, we just need someone to do the social science or the, the attitudes towards this particular aspect. And I have to explain to them, well, you know, I, I'm an economist. There's a particular paradigm or frame that I, a lens that I look through uh, when I'm analyzing these problems. And so you need to uh, understand that even within economics, you know, the way an agricultural economist might work, someone who typically works with, with farm households, is going to be different uh, than, uh, than an environmental economist who's thinking about ecosystem services, as an example. Okay. So 
what is the primary role of, of economists with respect to entomology? Uh, well, the way that I feel is that we are translators, right? Economists translate. And what does that mean? Economists translate the results of natural sciences, uh, natural phenomena, the, the biophysical processes that the entomologists are investigating, and we try to translate that into uh, terms or units that the public or policymakers can understand. And what are the units that are most universal? It's dollars. Okay, so that's what we do is we take, we, your goal, ideally you would estimate some biophysical relationship. You hand that, you know, that linear, that nonlinear model over to the economist. And then we try to use that information to uh, understand how that's going to affect the economy or how it's going to affect consumer behavior. Okay, why is this valuable? Well, primarily because, again, dollar signs are a common unit. People understand uh, how to a assess a, a $10,000 gain versus a $100,000 loss. Well, that's very, that's much more uh, easy to, to answer relative to say, uh, well, we're going to save this one species or we're going to lose these three species. Uh, or you could even go across units. You could say, we're going to save this species, but we're going to lose the, uh, we're going to face these health benefits. How do you quantify and put uh, units uh, uh, for different changes on the same units? Again, that's what, that's what economics can do for us. Um, and, and usually, and I've often found that these relationships and these collaborations are mutually beneficial. Right? I have an opportunity to sort of take the science and, and uh, put it into terms that are more meaningful to the public and policy leaders. And if, uh, on the flip side, it's to make that, that science um, more, more beneficial and more accessible. What I've also found, though, is that uh, sometimes when folks approach me, they, they have a particular um, angle or conclusion they'd like to reach. Okay? And, and it's important to understand that when you're going to work with an economist, uh, we can promise a process, but we can't promise you an answer. Uh, you know, my job, my role in terms of translating the science is to say, all right, what do we think is the average impact? of listing the endangered species or uh, change to health, health, uh, healthcare expenses. Okay. Where some might want to, as, as you see over here on the right, some might want uh, me to provide an answer that's especially large to say that pollinators are especially important. Other interest groups might find, might be interested in finding a really low number depending on what their overall, overall goals are. And if we're being true to the science and true to the data, we, we simply promise a process and not necessarily an answer. Okay, so some more tangible examples of what we can do with entomologists. Uh, the traditional approaches um, with respect to uh, agricultural economics or farming, uh, sort of standard agroecology are budgeting tools. So things like enterprise budgets and extension tools that help farmers uh, make well-informed decisions as to when to apply pesticides. Um, when not to apply pesticides. Uh, uh, relatedly, you might see uh, tools like economic threshold or economic injury. Okay. My area is a bit more abstract. Uh, we're trying to look at public goods or public issues such as biodiversity or abundance, and that would be associated with valuing ecosystem services or disservices. Uh, and that, those are, that idea is called non-market valuation and quantifying economic values. What you'll hear often among the economists are the ideas of willingness to pay or willingness to accept. Or again, even when we're talking about listing or uh, making available a particular pesticide or chemical, well, then we, we think that there will be changes in mortality or changes in morbidity. How are we going to quantify those impacts? Um, we also uh, like to think about accounting for attitudes and behavior. You know, a scientist may say, okay, we know that process sex is the most beneficial way of, of improving environmental outcomes. Well, even if process X is effective, if the farmer isn't willing to adopt it, it's sort of uh, ineffective. And then the last one, one that uh, I think a lot of folks are interested in is economic impact analysis. So how do we say that if, uh, you know, if this uh, emerald dash borer comes through and wipes out uh, all of the ash trees, how is that going to affect the economy overall with respect to jobs and tax revenue? Yes, we, we are definitely capable of doing that type of work. So if you're going to work with an economist, there are a few things that I'd like to outline. First, it's, it's really to get us involved earlier rather than later. Sometimes someone will ask me, hey, we need a, on a project, they'll say, we need to get a survey, it needs to be done next week. 
oh, that's a difficult spot to be in. You know, if I came to you as the economist and said, well, can you give us an ex science experiment that demonstrates this relationship in a week? It would put you in a bind as well. And so getting us involved early is really valuable to making sure that all of the data and needs are met. Be prepared to share your expertise uh, because we really need, rely on the scientists to help us understand what are the limits of what is being considered in the science. So, you know, if, if I'm trying to understand uh, a 10 percent change in, in chemical use, but the science says that they're really only considering a 2 or 3 percent change in chemical use, well, then 10 percent is sort of irrelevant in terms of that policy, policy prescription. Another important thing to know about economics is that our, our budgets are primarily in personnel. We don't have equipment costs. We don't have materials costs. You don't need to give us a lab truck. Uh, if you can give us a data set, which can get expensive, um, that, that's a big part of where we spend our time. Uh, another related part with the second part uh, of, the, of the presentation is survey participation incentives. Make sure that if you think you're going to need a survey done, specifically write in survey participation incentives into your grants. The last thing I'd like to mention here is that uh, the publications are, are different between the, the, the disciplines. Um, we have found success when we know that the paper is oriented towards an economics uh, audience or an entomology audience. But when the paper sort of uh, blurs the lines and it's interdisciplinary, finding that appropriate home and uh, responsive audience to who wants to take that paper has definitely a bit more challenging for us. Uh, another important aspect is that the social science journals, they tend to be lower, have lower impact factors. They tend to have fewer authors and they tend to take longer. Whereas uh, an entomology paper may take three to six months um, and an economics paper may take one, two, three years. Um, I had um, some bed bug data that I collected in 2016 and those papers are, part of it's on me, but some of those papers are only coming out in the last few months. Okay, so we're going to switch to the second part, and that's some, some uh, philosophy and some pragmatics of survey design. Okay, and again, please feel free uh, to pose questions at any time. So related to the fundamentals, um, many of you may be familiar with a famous quote, um, among statisticians at least, and that's the, the line that all models are wrong, but some are useful, from George Box. Okay. And so we know that the assumptions that we make in our statistics, they may not be valid. But even if the assumptions are wrong, can we still learn something from the data and from the models that we've run? Well, in the same sense, all surveys are wrong, but some are useful. There is no way to have a perfect survey to accomplish all of the data needs that you have from an individual. Um, and so we should acknowledge that and still say, all right, our survey can still accomplish the, the goal the task at hand in terms of helping us illustrate or understand, um, you know, behavioral or attitudinal phenomena uh, that can link back to entomology. And this is important because economics is about efficiency. We're trying to make trade-offs. We're trying to get the best outcomes possible. And so for a survey, we can do the same thing. We can uh, chase, we can ascertain efficiency by trying to maximize the information gained from any particular respondent. We know it won't be perfect, but we can do a good job of, of going after that objective function. Okay, so a few other fundamentals. The first thing is to prioritize. Make sure you really have a good sense before you talk to the economist or before you talk to any social scientist, really understand what is your primary question? What are your secondary questions? If you have secondary questions and prioritize them, what is the thing that you absolutely must make sure that you answer to the, to the best uh, of your ability? You also wanna be really clear about the population on the audience of interest. You know, if we talk about beekeepers and doing a survey of beekeepers, do we really mean commercial beekeepers, the guys who are going to California each winter? Do we mean the sideliners who are selling honey? Do we mean the backyard beekeepers? And so having a very clear idea of who it is that we need to communicate with is, is an important aspect. Uh, know your budget. You know, if we're going to do an online survey, those tend to be much more affordable relative to a mail survey. Um, we also highly recommend starting from the uh, previous work. There's absolutely, there's no reason to reinvent the wheel. Look at what others have laid before you in terms of uh, coming up with attitudinal questions, the types of scales they're using, and learn from them. Uh, even among the economists, we do it all the time. So the second really, really important uh, sort of uh, fundamental is that assume people are lazy. Um, I, I wholeheartedly believe this. 
And so what's an example of that? You know, you as a researcher, you may say, okay, I need to make sure that I get certain information across to the, to the respondent. And in this case, we're trying to understand um, the, we're trying to make sure that the respondent understands um, this whooping crane reintroduction program. You want to make sure certain information gets across to them. And you're, you're happy because you've gotten across all of your key information in about 160 words. So the researcher is looking at this and saying, well, we've, done, we've gotten all the details across in a, in a succinct way. Well, what is the respondency? The respondency is the first sentence, the last sentence, and a whole bunch of gunk in the middle. And it begs, skip me now. They look at the 160 words and they say, of course I'm gonna skip this and just move on to the next question. Big blocks of text are, are uh, discourage the respondent from continuing or answering the question, all right? And so we really wanna avoid that. The next important fundamental is consistency and validity. All right, so what do I mean by that? It means designing a question and uh, such that 95% of people, 95% uh, uh, of people interpret and answer a question in the same way. And this, is, this can be difficult because you may say, all right, uh, how, how, um, how often do you check on your bees? Okay, and some people might interpret that to mean, well, how often do I do a formal hive inspection? Some people might mean, might interpret that as to mean, how often do I open up the lid? Some other people might interpret that as how often do I put on my, my bee suit? Okay, and so these different interpretations invalidate the, the data. We don't know what we're interpreting. And so we really wanna make sure that as many people can interpret and answer the question in the same way as possible. Another key idea is trying to elicit an honest response. Sometimes we ask questions that we know that there may be a socially acceptable answer. You know, how, how much money do you give to your, to your favorite charity? Well, you know, it's easy to say I give $1,000 to my favorite charity. And so these socially desirable responses, they, they bias our data, and we want to try to encourage respondents to answer in an honest way. The last piece to this consistency and validity is while we chase precision, we have to acknowledge cognitive constraints. So I may say, okay, are you willing uh, to pay an extra, uh, what is it that you're willing to pay per night for um, bees in the hotel? Okay, that's an open-ended question. It's a question people have never been asked before, and they may be inclined to skip the question or to just put zero. And it's a, it's a tough question. And so uh, an easier way to facilitate that question is to simply say, well, if this hotel was an extra $5 or $1 per night, would you be willing to pay an extra dollar per night knowing that there were bees here at the hotel? And so while it gives us a lot less information, we believe in the credibility with respect to the responses provided uh, by, by participants. Okay, so now we're gonna move into some sort of uh, typical uh, recommendations for designing a survey. And the first one uh, is with respect to question design. So how do we think about the way we design questions to get at this consistency, to um, avoid laziness, to make sure that we have focused on our primary goals? Okay, so the first one is design with analysis in mind. So cognitive effort really matters. Uh, with the example before, we wanna try to avoid open-ended questions. Okay, we want to try to avoid high effort questions. What do I mean by a high effort question? Suppose someone said, rank the following 10 items from most to least important. Well, ranking 10 items takes, uh, is a labor. And so we, we would expect people to, to skip that question. And if they do, suppose they only answer part of the question. Suppose they randomly, uh, they move, they select their most preferred and their least preferred. Well, how do we interpret those middle responses? You know, do we take it at face value and basically say those other answers that haven't moved, that haven't been ranked, those are the real rankings, or do we have to throw them out? So we want to acknowledge cognitive effort. If possible, we want to try to take the survey online. So online surveys are, are wonderful because they automatically uh, do data enumeration. They provide us with things like randomization, videos, display logic, so that way if someone says, yes, I'm a beekeeper, well then only the beekeepers see a certain set of questions. Okay, um, even, uh, I would even recommend doing the survey, uh, in-person surveys online. So you'll see over here to the right, there's this QR code and an iPad. Well, this is an in-person survey where students basically scan the QR code and they could take the survey on their phone. 
So it really eliminated a lot of the, the challenges of trying to hand type in all of the, you know, all the paper, pen and paper surveys. We want to think about having responsive ranges. So making sure that, uh, that basically when people answer these questions, we're getting a good spread with respect to responses. A question that 99% uh, of people answer the same way isn't uh, very illustrative uh, in terms of explaining some dependent variable. We want to try to frame questions in an objective way. So we can ask something like, uh, how often did you go to your favorite restaurant last week? Okay, that's, that's, uh, there's a concrete answer to that relative to say, uh, asking them how many times do you think you're going to go in the coming week? Uh, if we can also quantify it, that's, that's a valuable way of helping uh, the validity of our data. So, you know, how often did you go in the past month as opposed to how often did you go in, in the recent past? So quantifying things so that way people have a consistent frame of reference when they're answering. We want to make sure that the reading level is in an eighth grade reading level if possible. Uh, we want to try to avoid leading questions using neutral language, meaning that uh, we don't want to lead the respondent to think that there is a, a socially acceptable or socially desirable answer. We want to avoid vague terms. We want to try to be precise. And so, uh, again, that goes back to if I can say last week as opposed to recently, last week is much more precise relative to recently. Uh, you know, again, just anything that you can uh, use to avoid um, difficulties in the, in the survey, things, things like double negatives or technical language. Use randomization. Make sure that the answers appear in random orders. Going back to that example of the big blocks of text, we want to try to skip blocks, uh, avoid big blocks of text. Use bullet points. Have lots of white space. Uh, use pictures. But if you're going to use a picture, make sure you're pre-testing that picture so that way you've kind of verified that people are interpreting and collecting the information that you had intended from that picture as opposed to uh, gleaning something else that you had not expected from that picture. Okay, turning to the survey design, the broader survey design itself, we need to be thinking about, again, this cognitive effort piece. We don't want to overburden responses. We don't want them to skip questions or to just um, uh, uh, delete, uh, remove, exit the survey altogether. So uh, best practice now, we usually think that surveys that are 12 to 15 minutes long are pretty good. If you talk to any of the big survey firms now, like, you know, SurveyMonkey, Qualtrics, any of the big marketing firms, they'll, they really discourage you from going over 20, but ideally 12 to 15 is where they're looking. Um, do not advertise a survey about your exact topic. If I had told people in my bed bug survey, hey, this is a survey about bed bugs, I would have completely skewed the people who had participated. Instead, we simply left it with, okay, this is a survey about your preferences in hotels. Okay, try to start off with easy questions, things that they can uh, easily answer. Things like, well, did you stay in a hotel in the last week? Or do you know, uh, have you ever uh, been inside of a beehive? These are easy answers, uh, easy questions that can sort of get them thinking in the right direction. Save the sensitive questions and the demographic questions for the end. So absolutely ask them so that way you can verify that your sample is uh, that your sample matches the population. Uh, and the second part of survey design is making sure we allow for comments at the end. Lots of lots of white space. You know you want it to be clean. Um, be careful with how much you use italics, underlines, and bolds. You know it can get overwhelming. Um, so just try to think of an uh, Apple products. They're very clean and crisp. Uh, well, a newer idea is trying to think about um, sort of more entertaining questions, something that you can still learn from the respondent, but uh, also provide some engagement with them. So a good example is this honey, which is the honeybee question. I, I really like this question because I, I, I've often had people ask me after the survey is over, well, which one was the honeybee? And so I feel like I've, I've added, um, uh, did, had some value add there. Um, and then the last piece is, People are getting inundated with surveys and they're going through them faster and faster. And so we want to verify if they're paying attention. Attention check questions are becoming the norm, in, in, especially in online surveys. Uh, the last piece that I want to highly stress to you is survey refinement and implementation. Oops, sorry about that. Um, we want to shop the survey around to, to reach that 95% consistency goal. Okay, so we, what does that mean? It means getting individual feedback, trying to address those straightforward issues by getting feedback from our friends, from classmates, from colleagues, and resolving the straightforward issues 
So that way we can go into a focus group and focus on more nuanced issues. Okay. We've, we've sort of eliminated the easy problems and we can focus our time and focus groups to really uh, hammer out the, the more difficult issues. And we want those focus group participants to be from the population of interest. I can't simply, uh, speaking from my own experience, I can't try to speak on behalf of beekeepers. I need beekeepers in the room to tell me about their experiences. Now, focus groups are important because I would honestly tell you that there are no there are no good there are no good surveys that haven't done focus groups, okay? Unless it's built on another survey that has done a focus group. And what is the right number? Well, that depends on the context. Sometimes I've had as many as six or eight focus groups because I'm trying to survey a wide variety of populations. Other times it'll be uh, as few as two. And then this last piece is pilot testing. That means basically having a soft launch. So you're ready to share your survey with the farmers or with the general population or with homeowners. Well, just collect 50 or 100 responses, analyze your data, see if it looks the way you expected it to. And then from there, go to your full launch of 100, uh, 100 or 1,000 responses. Okay. So the last thing I'll do is I'll go through a few exercises to demonstrate some of these points. So this first exercise is asking the question, all right, do you favor the current administration's handling of taxes and immigration reform? Yes, no, or unsure. Okay. So what's the problem here? Well, the problem in, in, in survey parlance is that it's a double-barreled question. Okay. One answer for multiple issues. Are they saying yes or no to taxes, immigration, or both? So we don't really, we can't really uh, understand what the data is telling us. So what can we do? We can reform this, uh, reformulate this to only be about a single issue, about immigration. Okay. But this still has issues. This question, do you favor the current administration's position? Well, the problem in this case is that it leads to social desirability bias. So we have inherently informed the respondent to think that the right answer is that they should favor the current, uh, current immigration reform. So we should reformulate this question to have a more balanced or neutral perspective. So what is your opinion of the current administration's handling of immigration reform? So I am going to, I have a few other um, exercises, but I see that we're running out of time. So I'll just save those. Uh, if people have specific questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, and uh, that's, that's all I have for my presentation. Great, thanks so much, Jared. That was uh, really great information. Um, so I wanted to see uh, and open it up. I think we would probably have time for just about one question or so um, before we hit the hour. Um, has anything been submitted, um, Miata, through the, the chat? I don't think so. Okay. Um, well, in that case, I can, I, I can always go back to the other questions. I'll, uh, I think I'll just go through this sec, I just, if I have the chance, I'll go through the second exercise. So in the case of the second exercise, which we can briefly go through, we can ask the question, how often do you buy gas? Well, that's ambiguous. You know, what does that mean by how often? Is that every day, every week, every month? Well, we can reformulate that question a little bit. Now, how many times in the past year did you buy the gasoline? Well, so we've, we've, Reduce the ambiguity, but this is still an open-ended question, and that lends uh, itself to people skipping the question. All right, so we want to try to avoid open-ended questions. So if we reformulate it and say, okay, well, how often uh, we can give them some response categories, never, one or 12 times a year, 13 to 24 times a year, well, that's okay, but people don't really think about how often they buy gas per year. That's uh, an inappropriate unit of, of uh, measure. Okay, so instead, we need to make sure that we're approaching people and facilitating the fact that people are lazy, like meeting people where they are. And so that means, okay, people don't think about buying gas every year. They think about buying gas, you know, every week or several times a month, that type of thing. So that's just another example of how we think about uh, refining our questions to meet people where they are and get the best data possible. All right, that, now that will be the real end this time. All right, wonderful. Well, uh, with that, it looks like we are out of time. Um, so I'll go ahead and conclude this session. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for participating in today's webinar and a big thanks to our presenters for preparing and sharing such great uh, content. Um, as a reminder, all ESA webinars are 
archi excuse me, archived on the ESA website at www.entsoc.org. We look forward to joining, um, having you join us again for another online session in the future. All right, thanks everyone and have a great afternoon.